Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are learning about our digestive systems. This lecture will be the longest of the semester, not because I have that much to say, but because we are supposed to wait 60 minutes before exercising. This will also be one of the most fun lectures to practice at home. You eat multiple times a day, so every time you eat, you can trace the food through your body and think about what is happening along the way. On second thought, the reproductive systems are probably the most fun to practice, but this takes second place. On your screens, you will see a sword swallower, along with some other fun animations. Sword swallowing has been around since before the first century when it spread into Greece and Rome. It has provided hours of entertainment and is popular in street performances, circuses, and other types of acrobatic theater. It began to die out in the mid-19th century and was outlawed in Scandinavia in 1893, but that same year was featured at the World Columbian Exposition at the Chicago World's Fair. In the early 1900s, traveling circuses and sideshows in America were trying to push the envelope, so people tried to swallow longer swords, mini swords, or even bayonets to name a few. In order to perform this trick without injury, the performer must lean the head back, hyperextending the neck, and relax the upper esophageal sphincter while controlling retching. The sword is lubricated by saliva through the mouth, past the pharynx, straightening the flexible esophagus, and the stomach is brought into line as the sword enters through the cardiac opening. In 1868, a German doctor named Adolf Kussmaul used an endoscope to look inside the stomach of a sword swallower who could easily gulp down an 18 and a half inch by half inch instrument. The longest sword swallowed on record is 22.83 inches, and the record for the most swords swallowed is 24. That's probably not how you expected to start this lecture but that is some food for thought. To begin, let's list some functions you will need to know. The most important and maybe most enjoyable is the ingestion of food. The ingested food is then mechanically and chemically broken down into smaller and smaller components. This system provides room for storage for the food and it absorbs the nutrients and water we need to survive. Remember, you are just a vessel for your cells. All of your cells need nutrients and create waste. You are just the larger thing they control to do their bidding. Along with absorption, your body synthesizes some vitamins, and last, it eliminates all the stuff you don't need. Our digestive system is divided into the alimentary canal and accessory organs. As you can see in this diagram, the subdivisions of the alimentary canal listed on the left are the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, and small and large intestines. The accessory organs listed on the right are the salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Not shown in this diagram are the appendix and the lesser and greater omenta. This image is here as a reference tool that might be handy as you work through this week's material. It shows the regions of the small intestine and many of the other structures you will have to know. Let's work our way through the body as if we were dinner and discuss what happens at each location through the alimentary canal. Food first enters our mouth, passes through the pharynx into the esophagus, which transports it to the stomach. Next, it passes into the small intestine, the large intestine, through the rectum, and out through the anus. Essentially, you can think of the alimentary canal as a tube within a tube. It begins at the mouth and ends at the anus and passes through, wait for it, the coelom. All right, 182 terminology. The outer trunk wall is covered in the parietal peritoneum. Just like we saw the parietal pericardium and parietal pleura, here we have the parietal peritoneum. And lining the organs themselves is, of course, the visceral peritoneum, also referred to as the serosa. Another term you may have heard before is the mesentery. The mesentery is a double fold of peritoneum, which holds the organs in place by connecting them to the abdominal wall. The alimentary canal is made of four layers the serosa, muscularis, submucosa, and mucosa. As we go through the structures of the alimentary canal, you will see the presence of each layer, but they are modified in a way that is beneficial to its location. The visceral peritoneum, or serosa, is the outermost connective tissue sheath that helps hold the organs in place. The muscularis externa is made of an inner circular layer that wraps perpendicularly to the canal, and an outer longitudinal layer that runs parallel to the canal. 
Together, these layers of smooth muscle facilitate a process called peristalsis. Peristalsis occurs when circular muscles contract behind a bolus of food. The circular muscles relax in front of the bolus, and the longitudinal muscles contract to keep the bolus moving. Deep to the muscularis is the submucosa. The submucosa is also made of connective tissue, but it allows for lots of blood vessels, nerves, and glands to pass through. And finally, the mucosa, which is lined with epithelial tissue. We'll see lots of variability in this layer as we go through today's lecture. In the mouth, we find stratified squamous epithelial tissue, which protects our oral cavity from abrasion. Mechanical digestion occurs when the teeth grind our food into smaller pieces, increasing the surface area. While this is happening, the salivary glands are releasing salivary amylase to start breaking down carbohydrates. The average person produces about two pints of saliva every day. That's about the same as two cans of soda. At the same time, the tongue is mixing the food with the saliva and forming a bolus, or a ball of food. Swallowing then directs the bolus through the oropharynx and into the laryngopharynx where it is deflected into the esophagus by the epiglottis. Unfortunately, for those of you pre-dental majors, we don't spend much time on teeth, but here you can see the incisors used for nipping, the canines used for shearing, and the bicuspids and molars both used for grinding. Remember, humans evolved to be omnivorous, so we have teeth that help with eating meat and for grinding plant matter. In the bottom left, you can see some of the anatomy of a tooth. Be sure to floss and protect your enamel. It's actually the hardest substance in the body. Otherwise, you will have problems with your teeth. When we are young, we have 20 deciduous or baby teeth, which are later replaced by 32 permanent or adult teeth. Here, you can see those permanent teeth in the maxilla and mandible waiting to replace the deciduous teeth. In this view, we can see our salivary glands. Located posteriorly, close to the ears, are the parotid glands. Below the tongue are the sublingual glands. And down here are the submandibular glands. This image shows you the salivary glands on a cadaver. They are digitally enhanced with blue to make them stand out better. This is always a good slide to study for tests. Now that we have mechanically ground down our food using our teeth and those muscles from 201, the temporalis, pterygoid, and masseter muscles, mix that food with salivary amylase from our salivary glands and form the bolus with our tongue, it's time to swallow and move that bolus into the stomach. The upper esophagus is solely skeletal muscle and transitions into smooth muscle. When we swallow, we have voluntary control in the upper esophagus, and then peristalsis through smooth muscle takes over. The lumen of the esophagus is lined with stratified squamous epithelial tissue to reduce abrasion from the food being swallowed, or swords if you prefer those. Peristalsis moves the bolus into the stomach. Here, we see three layers of muscle instead of two in the muscularis externa the longitudinal, circular, and now also the oblique. These three layers of muscle grind and churn the bolus in multiple directions while mixing it with chemical secretions. This fluid is now referred to as chyme and has the consistency of baby food. As the chyme is churned, proteins are denatured, chemical bonds are broken, and other enzymes are activated. This breaks the food down into smaller and smaller molecules. The stomach has the ability to stretch and can hold up to four pounds of food at one time. Look out, dining hall, here I come. This is actually facilitated by the rugae, or the folds in the stomach wall. Superiorly, the esophageal sphincter prevents anything moving back into the esophagus. If you have heartburn, acidic chyme moves back past the esophageal sphincter. And last, the pyloric sphincter regulates the movement of chyme out of the stomach and into the small intestine. In Greek, the word pylorus means gatekeeper and is where the word pylon comes from. We just saw that the muscularis externa has three layers of muscle, and one other difference is in the mucosa. It's a harsh environment in the stomach, and the pH fluctuates around one or two. So in this location, we see a quick change from stratified squamous in the esophagus into simple columnar. Here, goblet and other cells produce a thick layer of mucus to protect the epithelial tissue from the acidic environment. 
The stomach is also protected by tight junctions in the epithelial cells, and these cells are replaced every three to six days, being sloughed off and mixed into our chyme and digested. Gastric pits, openings in the epithelial layer, lead deeper into gastric glands. Inside are two cells you will need to know. As you can see in this inset, the first type are the parietal cells. These cells produce hydrochloric acid. This will aid in chemical digestion, but also creates an environment to deter any pathogens entering with our food. The other cell type are chief cells, and they produce pepsinogen. In the presence of hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen converts into an active form called pepsin, which breaks down proteins. This image shows you that chemical reaction. Here you can see the parietal cells producing hydrochloric acid. Down here, chief cells are producing pepsinogen into pepsin. And you can see its effect on proteins. In lab, you will be looking at the esophagus stomach junction slide. Be sure to study this carefully. On the left, you can see the stratified squamous cells in the underlying basement membrane. On the right, you can see the gastric pits lined with simple columnar epithelial tissue and a sudden change between the two tissues in the middle. Despite what I just said, the stomach is actually involved in very little chemical digestion. Remember, the role of digestion is to pulverize and reduce food to the size of molecules so nutrients can be absorbed into the bloodstream. The small intestine, about two-thirds of the overall digestive tract, is where 90% of the digestion and most of the absorption of nutrients takes place. Proteases break down proteins, amylases break down carbohydrates, and lipases break down fats. Interestingly enough, laundry detergents often contain several different classes of these enzymes in order to get your clothes clean. Anyways, after continuing to break down the chyme with powerful enzymes, the small intestine absorbs the nutrients and passes them into the bloodstream. Your small intestine is about 22 to 23 feet long, and the surface area of the mucosa is around 2,700 square feet, about the size of a tennis court. The release of chyme from the stomach is regulated by the pyloric sphincter. It enters the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum, then it passes into the jejunum, and finally the ileum. In lab, it is crucial for you to be able to differentiate the three regions from each other under a microscope. We will discuss the differences between these regions as we move through the next handful of slides. But first, let's stop and take a closer look at the gross anatomy of the small intestine. We can see all four layers here in the red boxes. In the lumen, we can see the circular folds that increase the surface area of the mucosa by a factor of two to three. These slow the movement of the chyme to increase nutrient absorption while mixing, churning, and moving it along. Zooming in on the circular folds, you can see they are lined with finger-like projections called villi, which increase the surface area by a factor of 10. Villi are covered with simple columnar epithelial tissue and goblet cells. Remember, this tissue has a brush border made of microvilli. The microvilli increase the absorptive surface area by a factor of 20 and contain some enzymes to finish chemical digestion. Zooming in even closer, you can see all those villi projecting into the lumen. You can see they are lined with simple columnar and goblet cells. The goblet cells produce mucus to help the chyme move, but also to prevent the enzymes in the chyme from digesting the cells of the small intestine. Inside each of these villi is a network of capillaries. Down to the right, in the red box, you can see an arterial bringing in nutrient-dense and oxygenated blood to each of the cells of the small intestine, and their metabolic wastes leave through the venules. But looking back at the villi, the nutrients that have been broken down chemically and mechanically are passing through the brush border and into the capillary beds. Nutrients flow from this first capillary bed to the liver through the hepatic portal vein. All this blood needs to be filtered by the liver, so if you ate something toxic, are taking some kind of prescription drug, or had a meal high in glucose, the liver filters the blood and begins processing, metabolizing, or storing these compounds. Here is that lacteal coming off a lymphatic vessel. You learned in the lymph lab that lipids in the small intestine are packed into chylomicrons and absorbed into the lacteals. This gives lymph a milky color. They are then deposited back into circulation through the thoracic duct. And last, we have the intestinal crypts. 
They are populated with goblet cells to protect the tissue from degradation as well as dividing stem cells to replace older cells every three to six days like we saw in the stomach. Here's our first section of the small intestine, the duodenum. It is C-shaped and only about 10 inches long. Not only does the chyme come through from the stomach, but the duodenum receives fluid from the pancreas and gallbladder. The pancreas produces digestive enzymes as well as bicarbonate that lowers the pH of the acidic chyme. The gallbladder releases bile and bile breaks down and emulsifies lipids. If you look at a bottle of Italian salad dressing, you'll see that the oil collects in a big glob. But when you shake the bottle, there are emulsifiers added to the dressing that break that glob up into smaller blobs so the oil mixes easier. This is what's essentially happening with bile. Let's study the image to the right. Can you identify the type of tissue present in this bracket? What are the clues you use to identify this tissue? So what layer is this? If you said the muscularis because you saw smooth muscle, you are correct. Now, think back to the four layers of the alimentary canal we looked at earlier. What would this layer be and how do you know? Think about what type of tissue is present in each layer and think about other landmarks you should know. Hopefully you said the submucosa, but why? Remember the submucosa is innervated and vascularized, so there is connective tissue present for those structures to pass through. If you were thinking serosa, well that's also connective tissue, but it is thinner and it is the outermost layer. Here, you can also see the duodenal glands. You can see bundles of these round structures that, like the pancreas, produce an alkaline secretion to reduce the acidity of the incoming chyme. And what about here? We see another layer on the other side of the submucosa. Another hint, think about what the white empty space could be in the image at the bottom. We are talking about the alimentary canal, or a tube, so that empty space is going to be our lumen. Therefore, this layer is next to the lumen, which makes it our mucosal layer. Another few hints to help you get oriented here are that in the mucosal layer, we see lots of clear goblet cells and simple columnar epithelial tissue. We know epithelial tissue lines body cavities or openings, so here this tissue is lining the lumen. The goblet cells are producing mucus to protect against the low pH, and the simple columnar and the microvilli will help in absorption. So always be thinking about form and function. Another clue are these projections down here. These are the villi creating lots of surface area. So when you are looking through the scopes, use these clues to help you figure out what section you are viewing. Because we are in the duodenum, and because the gallbladder and pancreas add secretions to the chyme, let's make a tangent and discuss these structures before we go on to the other sections of the small intestine. You will need to be able to label this image for your notebook and tests. The pancreatic duct runs down the center of the pancreas, which leads over to the accessory pancreatic duct and the hepatopancreatic duct. You may be wondering why the prefix hepato, which refers to the liver, is attached to this, especially when you can see it is green and coming from the gallbladder. We'll get there in a minute. Here's where the secretions end up, right in the duodenum, so they can be mixed in with the chyme coming in from the stomach. You may remember this image from the pancreas from the endocrine system. Before we begin, and as a side note, the title of this slide is hyperlinked to Khan Academy if you need further clarification on the pancreas. If you think back to the endocrine system, we talked a bit about its functions as an endocrine gland. The pancreas makes glucagon from alpha cells and insulin from beta cells. I've always differentiated the two because glucagon has an A in it and alpha starts with A. Maybe that will help you. Under the scope, you will see these light pink structures called pancreatic islets. This is where the alpha and beta cells are located, but you won't need to differentiate them on a test. The pancreas also has an exocrine function. Do you remember what the difference is between the two? The endocrine system is releasing hormones directly into the blood without ducts, while the endocrine system is secreting other substances through ducts. There are specific cells called acinar cells that produce all the other pancreatic enzymes and release them through the pancreatic duct. The enzymes from these cells break down proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. The smaller image on the left is a good reference image to practice the location of all the structures we are talking about. 
The image on the right is illustrating the homeostatic mechanisms of insulin and glucagon, and we're going to look at that. We'll start here with our normal blood glucose levels. When your blood glucose levels rise above the normal amounts, your body works to reduce those back to the normal range. The beta cells of the pancreatic islets release insulin into the circulatory system. Insulin targets body cells to use glucose, triggers the liver to store glucose as glycogen, and inhibits gluconeogenesis. I know those are some of your favorite words from lecture. Blood glucose decreases and returns to normal. If blood sugar goes too low, maybe you've been cramming away for your 202 lab test over digestion and you haven't eaten in a few hours, the alpha cells from the pancreatic islets release glucagon into the circulatory system. Glucagon targets body cells and inhibits their ability to take up glucose, targets the liver to initiate glycogenolysis, and stimulates gluconeogenesis. More of your favorite terms. Blood glucose increases and eventually returns to normal. To the right, you can see that in a normal individual, the pancreas produces insulin and that insulin binds to insulin receptors on target cells. Diabetes mellitus is a group of diseases that results in high blood glucose. Most people have heard of diabetes mellitus or at least know someone with this disease. In type 1 diabetes, a person's pancreas produces little to no insulin. This was previously known as juvenile diabetes, but contrary to popular belief, type 1 diabetes can occur in people of every age, race, and size. In fact, there are more adults who have type 1 diabetes than children. In type 2 diabetes, your body develops a resistance to insulin. Therefore, it cannot bind to insulin receptors. Check out the American Diabetes Association website for more information and helpful resources about diabetes. Our next accessory gland is the liver. Functions of the liver include filtering blood from the digestive tract, storing nutrients, producing plasma proteins, detoxifying the blood, producing bile, and absorption and processing of bilirubin. We've mentioned this before, but blood from some abdominal veins and organs passes through the hepatic portal system and into the liver. There are two capillary beds, the first being in the specific organ, for example the small intestine, and the second bed located in the liver. You can see this represented in the image on your right. Here's another image you can use as a study tool that shows the location of the liver as well as other organs and structures. Here you can see the anterior and inferior views of the liver. The liver is divided into four lobes. The right lobe, the left lobe, the caudate lobe, and the quadrate lobe. The caudate lobe gets its name because it kind of looks like a tail. The gallbladder is located on the inferior surface of the liver and is actually green in color in real life. And right here we have the porta hepatis not to confuse it with the hepatic portal vein. The porta hepatis is a fissure in the liver through which different vessels pass. In cirrhosis of the liver, healthy tissue is replaced by fibrous scar tissue, reducing its functionality. Cirrhosis of the liver is usually caused by excessive alcohol use, but also can be caused by the hepatitis virus. Last year, there were about 31,000 people who died from cirrhosis. Zooming in on the liver, we can see hexagonal lobules composed of hepatocytes. At each of the corners of the lobule are the hepatic triads. The hepatic triads consist of three vessels, the hepatic artery in red, the hepatic portal vein in blue, and the bile ductule in green. The hepatic artery is bringing oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood from the aorta to the hepatocytes. These cells are working hard, so they need a fresh supply of blood to conduct cellular respiration, remove waste, and to process the blood coming in from the hepatic portal vein. The hepatic portal vein is bringing blood from the first set of capillaries around abdominal organs into the sinusoids. If you remember back to the blood vessel chapter, sinusoid capillaries, shown in this inset to the right, are leaky and allow for greater movement of cells and materials. As blood travels from the outer perimeter of the lobule through the sinusoid towards the central vein, the hepatocytes process and filter the blood. At the same time, the hepatocytes are making bile, 
which is being released into the bile ductules and transported to the gallbladder. Be sure to find all the associated structures on your scopes. Here is the lobule, and to the right is the hepatic triad. The hepatic artery has a thicker tunica media and is a bit rounder than the hepatic portal vein up here. The bile ductule is easier to identify because of the simple cuboidal tissue. The name triad is actually a misnomer. It was named before the discovery of the lymphatic vessel in the branch of the vagus nerve. You don't need to identify those for lab, it's just interesting to know they are there. And last, this is the central vein that takes deoxygenated, filtered blood from the sinusoids to the hepatic veins and back into the inferior vena cava. Remember the gallbladder lies inferiorly to the liver and all those hepatocytes are making bile and sending it here. Bile has a green pigment because of the presence of bilirubin, and bilirubin comes from the breakdown of hemoglobin. Last week, you tested for the presence of bilirubin in urine to see if there was any evidence of liver damage, bile ductual blockage, or hemolytic anemia. The gallbladder stores and concentrates the bile, and during digestion, the gallbladder releases bile through the bile duct and into the duodenum to emulsify lipids. Bile comes out of the liver into the common hepatic duct and is stored in the gallbladder. Gallstones can form in the gallbladder and get lodged in the cystic duct. When gallstones are present and the gallbladder contracts to release bile, it can create excruciating pain. Bile passes down the bile duct where it meets the pancreatic duct at the hepatopancreatic duct and is released into the duodenum. All right, so we've made it through the duodenum and are now entering the next region of our small intestine. So take a minute and get your bearings. What layers can you identify and what tissues can you find? What layer do we have here? I hope you said the muscularis. So if that's the muscularis, then what is this layer? That's our submucosa. And finally, you should have said the mucosa for this layer. And because this region is responsible for most of the digestion and absorption, we see lots of tall villi. This region is called the jejunum. It's about six feet long, and the jejunum can be identified because there are no glands in the submucosa, just connective tissue. Okay, so how about in this bracket? What layer are we looking at? Did I trick you, or did you say the mucosa? Hopefully you saw the villi and lots of goblet cells in this layer. And what about up here? That's the muscularis again. So that means this is the submucosa. In this region, we see large lymph nodules present, and lymph nodules are aggregations of immune cells. They help protect the body against pathogens. Remember, lymph nodules are not lymph nodes. This region is called the ileum, and it's about 10 feet long. It connects with the large intestine at the ileocecal junction. Okay, so pause the video and take a few moments to review what we just went over as far as the histology of the small intestine. What regions are you looking at? What are the different layers? And what identifying structures are present? Okay, so our dinner is almost processed. In this image, you can see the large intestine. The large intestine is divided into different regions as well. Here, you can see the ascending colon because feces is moving up. Then it turns and passes through the transverse colon into the descending colon, through the sigmoid colon, into the rectum, and then finally out to the external environment. The external anal sphincter is under your control and everyone listening to this has certainly had to focus on contracting this little muscle before. Last, I wanted to point out this little structure here called the appendix. Some of you may have had this removed, but this is a small little tube-like structure that is highly populated with lymphocytes. The large intestine is primarily responsible for water and electrolyte reabsorption, feces formation, and some vitamin synthesis. As feces moves through the large intestine, water is reabsorbed back into the blood. 
if that feces stays put too long, you will reabsorb a lot more water than normal and you can get constipated. If you're not absorbing enough water out of that feces, that will come out as diarrhea. There are about 800 different species of bacteria that exist in your large intestine. And while most of them are mutually beneficial, they also produce gas. A lot of the gas we release is from swallowed air that works its way out. But the next time some does come out, you can blame your bacteria and not your dog. In lab, be sure to note the histology of the large intestine. There are no villi present in the mucosal layer, and you will see long crypts with extremely high amounts of goblet cells present. Last, we have the anal canal. Feces is held back by the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter before it leaves through the anus. Defecation is a mass peristalsis event that happens in the transverse to sigmoid colon as a result of reflexes and stretching of the stomach and intestines. I highly recommend clicking on the Squatty Potty link, if not just for the pure entertainment of this ad. Each year, more than 270,000 Americans develop a cancer of the gastrointestinal tract, including cancers of the esophagus, stomach, colon, and rectum. About half of these cancers end in death, and in 2017, colorectal cancer will have killed almost 52,000 people in the U.S., more than any other cancer except lung cancer. What's more, the digestive system is home to more cancers and causes more cancer mortalities than any other organ system in the body. Check out the American Cancer Society link here to learn more information. The last accessory organs I should mention are the greater omentum on the left and the lesser omentum on the right. They both have lots of nerves, blood vessels, lymph nodes, and lymph vessels, and prevent the intestines from adhering to the body wall. They are dyed green in these two images to stick out better, but they are in fact yellow because they are made of adipose tissue. You can use this dichotomous key to help you figure out which slide you are looking at in lab. You start with number one and then read each statement. If you see gastric pits in the mucosa, then you are in the stomach. But if you do not, then you move on to number two. In number two, you look for villi and then follow the next number. It's like choose your own adventure for histology, except on a test, you have to choose correctly. Make sure you look at all the histology this week in lab and spend more time than usual studying it because it is very challenging. You will also have a worksheet to fill out while you work on lab activities. Next week, we will go over the female reproductive system, so keep up with your review questions, your notebooks, and keep studying hard. See you next week.